So this is the last lecture in the series. Uh, we'll be covering asynchronous to synchronous interfacing. So any time that uh, we want to interface a system that doesn't have a clock with a system that does, we will need to cross a clock domain boundary. Uh, and there are a wide variety of ways to do that. Uh, but it all stems from a couple of fundamental problems. And so our goal is we have some requests coming into this clock domain, uh, and we want to uh, turn that into data and uh, synchronize it with the clock. Uh, but we'll immediately run into a few problems, the first being metastability, which we have talked about uh, in the last two lectures. Uh, basically, if the request arrives roughly at the same time as the clock, then the output on the data will just be uh, kind of indeterminate or metastable. It'll be at 0 0.5 volts uh, in both directions. And it can take arbitrarily long to resolve that metastability. Uh, the next problem is that uh, on the uh, delay insensitive side, we have a delay insensitive encoding. On the clock side, we generally have a binary encoding. Uh, and so we're going to have to uh, figure out how to convert between those two encodings in an effective way uh, that doesn't cost a bunch of circuitry. The next problem is that uh, we have on our delay insensitive side, we have an enable signal that we need to generate and send back. Uh, and this enable signal doesn't necessarily have to be uh, uh, generated uh, it doesn't have to be synced to the clock, synchronized to the clock, but it does have to be uh, only sent back once the data has been successfully clocked into uh, our clocked domain. And detecting that requires that you uh, have some way to check that, which means verifying that the uh, value on the request is equal to the value on the data for a given clock cycle. Uh, and we can work through how to do that, but uh, we have to make sure that we do. Uh, finally, what happens if the request is faster than the clock? Uh, what happens if it's slower? How do we uh, deal with buildup of tokens on the input if the request is faster? How do we uh, deal with signaling that there aren't any tokens on the output in the clock domain um, if the request is slower than the clock? Uh, and what happens for a wide bus uh, if we have skew across all of the data in that bus? Uh, how do we make sure that we de-skew that data, right? synchronize them to a single signal so that we can then clock it in at the same time? So uh, I'm not sure that I'll be answering quest all of these questions, but these are the things that you have to consider when going from a quasi-delay and sensitive domain to a clocked domain. Uh, a lot of the solutions that will be presented here uh, start with a bundled data domain, which is not the same as, equal, as a quasi-delay and sensitive domain, right? In bundled data, you use uh, the enable signal to clock your data. Uh, and so all of the data associated with the wide bus request is uh, already synchronized to the enable signal, right? Uh, and it's already lined up. You don't have data skew. Now, there are ways to, con uh, to convert a uh, quasi-delay insensitive uh, data bus to a bundled data bus. Uh, I will not explicitly be showing that here, but it involves effectively computing the validity of all of these values and then C elementing them together to get a single request out and then building a buffer from that, right? So uh, step one generally is convert to bundled data. Okay, so let's tackle our first problem which is metastability. Uh, the usual way that this is done is a two flip-flop synchronizer. Now, what happens is uh, this synchronizer uh, basically allows that first flip-flop to go metastable, and it allows that flip-flop to wait exactly one clock cycle uh, in order to resolve that metastability. And so if this 
two flip flop, if that first flip flop doesn't resolve that metastability within that single uh, clock cycle, then this synchronizer will fail and the second flip flop could go metastable. Right? And so we end up with a mean time to, uh, between failures or MTBF. Uh, and this is uh, generally computed as, as a kind of exponential decrease in, uh, in time based upon uh, a couple of factors. Uh, capital T is the input to output latency. And so in, in the case of a two flip-flop synchronizer, that is exactly one clock cycle, whatever the latency of your clock is or period of your clock is. Uh, tau is the uh, time constant of the flip-flop. Uh, it's effectively the uh, input to output latency of the flip-flop, right? Um, once your, basically once it is open, once your clock switches. Uh, the uh, TW is the window of susceptibility, right? So uh, the setup and hold times of your flip-flop effectively. Uh, and the and the frequency f is the frequency of the sender or receiver. Uh, now, if you plot this, you'll find that the uh, primary factor affecting the mean time between failures is the ratio of of the input to output latency uh, of your synchronizer to the uh, time constant of your flip flop. And so for a two flip-flop synchronizer, uh, that's, sh that's plotted here in blue. For a three flip-flop synchronizer, that's plotted in red. For a four flip-flop synchronizer, that's plotted in yellow. Uh, and uh, basically as this ratio increases, uh, we get a uh, much shorter mean time between failures, right? And so in general, you want your mean time to be uh, between failures to be roughly 10x the expected life of the device, of your system, right? And so if we set the expected life to be 100 years, uh, kind of conservatively, right? Then uh, the mean time to failure, between failures should be about 1,000 years uh, for your flip-flop, for your synchronizer. And so a reasonable ratio of uh, input output latency versus the time constant of the flip-flop is roughly around 1.3, something like that. Uh, and that'll give you your uh, thousand year mean time between failures. Generally, uh, multi-stage, right? Three-stage or four-stage uh, synchronizers are overkill. So generally you wanna stick to this two-stage uh, uh, synchronizer. Does that make sense so far? Okay, so obviously there's some problems this, with this approach, uh, but let's take a look at what the larger system of this approach looks like. Right, so if you want to set up a uh, clock domain crossing or a, uh, you know, a, an interface between a clockless domain and a clock domain, then you have your request go in through this uh, to flip-flop synchronizer if you are sending data into the clock domain, and you have your enable go into the two flip-flop synch synchronizer if you are uh, pulling data from the clock domain, right? Now, the problem, the big problem with this is that the uh, this two, flop, two flip-flop synchronizer must wait exactly one clock cycle, or I guess at least one clock cycle uh, between successive requests, right? And so you're you're sitting there, there's this huge latency between the uh, self-timed domain and the clocked domain, right? Which is going to really hurt your performance. And so all of the strategies that I'm about to show you are based around trying to improve your performance beyond this base approach. Um, and uh, all of these strategies also must be evaluated against um, the, the the potential to effectively do it wrong, right? And uh, significantly decrease your mean time between failures. And so there's this great paper uh, down here, which is 14 ways to fool your synchronizer. It's basically a list of papers where people got it wrong <laughs> and how they got it wrong in different ways.
Okay. Uh, so if we want to convert this to a bundled data domain, right? If we have a QDI domain on our uh, in our self-timed domain, and we have a clock domain on the sender or receiver, then we uh, convert to a bundled data domain first, right? And for the sender, that involves uh, computing some overall request for your data based upon the validity of all of the data in your uh, data path, right? And then converting the uh, data in your data path, which is generally a, a dual rail encoding, uh, to one that is favorable to uh, latches or flip-flops. And thankfully, uh, in most cases, that is also a dual rail encoding. So you're kind of fine. Uh, so uh, on the uh, clocked sender self-timed receiver side, we have to convert back from request and data into a QDI request. Uh, and that involves going through an encoder, which basically uh, ands the value of the data with the validity uh, signaled by the request to generate your delay and sensitive encodings. And what that looks like, what these two circuits look like, uh, are basically this, right? If you have uh, two dual rail encodings representing two bits of data, right? Delay and sensitive data, then computing the validity means oring the two rails and then uh, uh, combining them with a C element to get the total validity out, right? And so this C element waits until they're both valid and then waits until they're both neutral, right? On, on both ends of the handshake. The encoder takes this request and ands it into the value of the uh, data, right? And if you have uh, a, a bit of data represented by a single wire, then you're gonna need to throw an inverter on it here uh, on the input of this other AND gate to generate the um, inverted signal. Uh, I think I must have switched the true and false rails here. Um, mental note. This is inverted. What happened? How? It seems like you would still have issues, though, because you need to guarantee that that request line goes for the encoder goes high after all the bits are set. That seems like a potential issue. Uh, that is precisely the bundled data timing assumption. So you have to guarantee that in layout, uh, and you do that with delay lines on the request. So that covers conversion between a uh, QDI domain and a bundled data domain in order to get it into a clocked domain. So that's your first step. Um, the next step is taking a look at the protocols associated with these wires, right? We're just gonna look at a self-timed sender and a clocked receiver. Uh, the same strategies can be used for a clocked sender and a self-timed receiver. Uh, fortunately, this second case is quite a bit easier than the self-timed sender. And so we're going to look at the protocols that are happening on these wires uh, in red and blue. We have data, we have request, and we have enable. All right. So generally, in our quasi-delay and sensitive uh, handshake, we have a request and we have an enable. Right, and the request goes high first, followed by the enable going low, then the request goes low, and the enable goes high. With a bundled data protocol, we add data, and we add, um, or I guess with this protocol, we add data and we add a clocking mechanism. Right, so the bundled data pro protocol uses enable to clock in the value of the data, and you can see that data is valid in this assumption by the time the enable goes low. Right, so enable goes low, clocks in the value of the data, sends it on its way. Adding this clock signal tells us where we need to synchronize. And so uh, basically we need to make sure that we syn synchronize in line with uh, this enable signal, right? Because the clock will end up being the one that, the clock domain will end up being the one that drives this enable signal, right? The self-timed domain owns the request and the data, the clocked domain owns the enable signal. Uh, and so if we account for that two flip-flop synchronizer, then what this protocol ends up looking like is this. And so now we have the request goes high and 
it can because it can go at high with any you know any time with respect to the clock then uh, basically, every time the request changes, there's a, a chance for metastability that we then have to wait for for one clock cycle, right? And so the, the request starts to go high, we clock, we hit metastability, we wait a clock cycle, the metastability resolves, we clock again, we, uh, we find that the request is high in the clock domain, we lower the enable, then we wait for the request to start to lower, it starts to lower again, but it, it does so right at the beginning of the next clock boundary. It hits metastability again. We wait for it to resolve. It resolves by the next clock cycle, at which point we clock it again and raise the enable. And so you can see there's a huge amount of time, like four clock cycles here, uh, where this data is just sitting here on this channel, right? This is a huge overhead in terms of throughput and latency and energy. And so we need to figure out ways to communicate uh, this data through the clock domain faster. And also we need to figure out a way to communicate the fact that there uh, isn't actually a valid token uh, coming out of, the, of this synchronizer and into the clock domain. Now, typically the way to do that uh, is called the val-ready interface. And it is uh, generally used in the clock domain um, to handle flow control, much like the request enable uh, protocols, handshake protocols that we've seen in the uh, clockless domain. Uh, except that this particular Val-Ready protocol is tuned to uh, effectively operate the clock domain. And so when, uh, when we are good to go in both directions, the, uh, the valid signal actually remains high. Right, it just continues to remain high as long as there is data on this channel, uh, even if data were to be, consu be consumed in that cycle. Right, the ready signal remains high as long as there is space on the receiver to pull in that data, even if there is data again in the next cycle. Right, and if there is data uh, in the previous cycle as well. And so effectively, this clock can just go back and forth, and as long as the uh, as long as the pipeline doesn't get stalled, both your valid and your ready signals will stay high, right? And data will just continue to switch uh, from clock cycle to clock cycle. Now, the moment that you need to stall your pipeline, you need to lower the ready uh, signal. But the problem with this protocol is that the receiver won't recognize that the ready signal has been lowered until the next clock cycle. And so you need to have extra space wherever you're going to stall your inputs in order to pull in some extra token, right, uh, that uh, you weren't ready to handle in your normal flow. Either that or you need to preempt lowering the ready signal by an extra clock cycle, effectively. Um, and so there's an extra overhead associated with this protocol in handling that kind of juggling of data back and forth between uh, a sender who is, who is you know, continuously sending data and a receiver who uh, suddenly figures out that they're not re ready to receive data. And so you can see here is that extra data that arrives when the ready signal is low, and that data doesn't get clocked in until the next clock cycle. Okay, so then you raise the ready signal and there's a, a similar problem. Now you have to take your data that's, that's kind of built up in that extra kind of side storage unit and bring it into your normal flow. Uh, either that or you have to preempt uh, the raising of the ready signal so that um, the sender has enough time to send data to you on that clock cycle. On the sending side, it's a similar problem. Uh, you lower the valid signal when you uh, don't have valid data to send to the receiver, uh, and you have to raise the, the valid data once you are ready to send data to the receiver. Luckily, this uh, raised valid signal can get clocked in the next clock cycle, uh, and it's kind of fine. And so. Uh, 
the sender doesn't really have to deal with any of these problems quite as much. Our first approach to dealing with this problem is suppose that we are in a globally asynchronous, locally synchronous system. Uh, basically, you have multiple clock domains that are connected to, together via a clockless domain uh, that allows them all to communicate to each other. Uh, in which case, the clockless domain actually uh, could have full control over your clock signal for the clocked domain, right? Uh, and this is, of course, um, uh, in collaboration with some outside clock pin if you want to be able to clock your system separately uh, or in collaboration with some power management system that you need to use to uh, speed up or slow down your clock. Right? There are a lot of different systems that go into managing a clock domain. Uh, but on the self-timed side of things, we have a request and we have an enable. On the clocked side of the of this interface, we have our uh, data, we have our valid, we have our ready, and we have our clock signal. Uh, and this interface is responsible for not only uh, synchronizing the, uh, in this case, the clock to the asynchronous data, right, to the clockless data, uh, but it is also responsible for converting the QDI uh, encodings and enable and protocol uh, into the ValReady uh, protocol. And so if we uh, give control of the clock to our clock domain over to this interface, then uh, generally we have some kind of clock generator, right? And it's uh, often it... Uh, the kind of baseline clock generator is a cycle of inverters to create some kind of delay, right? Then we can um, use arbitration to interrupt that cycle. And uh, in this case, when we send a request to the arbiter, uh, it takes over, it sends the grant back, and the next request that comes to try to raise this the clock wire will stop, right? And the clock will stay low. Uh, now, you probably want to use an ideal arbiter for this uh, because you don't want both the clock and the grant to be high at the same time. Um, you will have to verify that to make sure. Uh, and so what does this interface look like? Well, uh, this is documented in uh, this paper, Asynchronous Techniques for System on Chip Design. And the first thing that we need to do is throw our uh, delay and sensitive data into a latch, right? And so our delay and sensitive in data is, is on L. So that's L.T and L.F. We latch it to create data.t and data.f. The next thing that we need to do is generate our uh, request for the, the grant on the stoppable clock, right? And so we do that when we know that our ValReady interface on the receiving end is ready, and when we have data to send uh, coming from our uh, clockless domain. So if there's if this is valid and we're ready, then we raise the request for the grant to stop the clock. Uh, when we receive our grant from the stoppable clock, then we make sure that the uh, latch on the data has uh, kind of stabilized to uh, the right value before raising the valid uh, wire on the sender. Uh, and we always wait for the grant before doing this. Uh, once that's done and we have, uh, we have signaled validity on the output, we lower the input enable. And we can do this because we, because we have latched the data and verified through this expression that the data has been has the data latching has completed. Uh, once the input data goes neutral, we lower the request for the stoppable clock, allowing the clock to start up again and clock in the data. Uh, we know at this point that it is valid and that there's data waiting on that bus. Uh, once the grant for the stoppable clock goes low and the clock goes high, then we know that the validity signal has 
uh, been clocked in on the clocked domain and we can lower it. However, there is a timing assumption that we must guarantee in layout, which is this validity signal needs to successfully go low before the next clock cycle, right? There is no self-timed uh, loop that acknowledges that sequence. Uh, once the validity signal is low, we are ready to receive new data from the asynchronous domain. Uh, and we need to make sure to generate some inverted version of the clock uh, in order to uh, in order to lower our validity signal. Um, this can be done either uh, with a latch in the clock, right, which creates a mutually exclusive high clock and inverse, uh, or as here, an inverter which we guarantee delay assumptions on. Wouldn't placing an inverter like that also somewhat avoid the hold time issues? Because then it would delay the changing of val to after the clock by a certain amount of time? Uh, yeah, it would. Um, as would a uh, a delay element between validity down and l.e up along with the clock domain, right? There are a lot of different ways to solve those uh, timing assumptions in layout, um, but you got to make sure to do that. Now, I've modified their implementation. Uh, they make extensive use of the half cycle timing assumption, and I have eliminated that from this design. Uh, you are welcome to use their design as long as you uh, validate that half cycle timing assumption in your layout, or you can use this design however you see fit. Uh, their design is probably faster because they use that assumption. Uh, it's up to you. Okay, so we've designed our uh, stoppable clock interface, right? This system successfully turns off the clock for a moment in order to uh, clock data into the clock receiver. Now, the cool thing about this design is that it has no mean time between failures. If you implement all of your delay assumptions correctly, this will not fail, right? There, there, there's no metastability in this system because that metastability is, is all segregated to this arbiter and uh, our self-time system effectively waits for that to resolve. Now, of course, we need to be able to uh, to handle, you know, multiple senders or receivers into this clocked domain, right? What if what if we have multiple channels which we want to interface with this clock domain, uh, and we want them to be able to share this stoppable clock? Uh, and uh, thankfully, we have actually discussed exactly the circuit that is used to do so, uh, and that's the bundling merge. Right, and so a set of requests to stop the clock come in. Uh, we send a request out to the root node of the arbitration system to get a grant. Uh, and then when that grant comes back, we service all of the requests that came in during that time all at once. Uh, and so this uh, mitigates the performance issues with a whole bunch of different um, systems coming in to try to stop your clock simultaneously. The next approach, possible approach, is if you don't have control over the clock and the clocked system, uh, is maybe we can pay this metastability cost in parallel. Uh, and so we, instead of uh, for every token that we receive, we pay that metastability cost on both the upgoing and downgoing of the requests, maybe we let all of those tokens kind of pile up in some kind of uh, queue. And we only pay that metastability cost when the queue flips from empty to not empty or from not empty to empty, right? As long as it stays in one of those two states, uh, then we can guarantee that the validity signal going into the clocked domain uh, is correct and doesn't change, right? And so a uh, paper did this and uh, I'm not gonna go into uh, extreme detail about their circuit because it has some pretty significant problems. Uh, but I will show you what their circuit looks like. Uh, 
so they set up this uh, combined asynchronous synchronous FIFO. So this bottom half is the synchronous side, and this top half is the asynchronous side. And it effectively acts as a cyclic FIFO. You have read and write pointers that uh, rotate around this FIFO, and those pointers place data or pull data from different cells in this, uh, in this FIFO. In order to detect whether this FIFO is empty, uh, you need to check whether the read and write pointers are equal, right? Uh, now that could also signal full, so there's some extra logic to make sure that you get empty versus full correct. Um, however, not empty is the read and write pointers aren't equal. They're not at the same location. Uh, and so uh, once the empty detector uh, changes, then you run that result uh, through, a, uh, through a synchronizer. Now, this cell, uh, the implementation of an individual cell in this FIFO uh, looks like this, right? You have uh, kind of this synchronized um, weak condition half buffer reshuffling here. Uh, sending the read and write pointer, or sending the write pointer uh, left around this loop, right? Uh, and then it, uh, whenever you have a write pointer, you pull data into this register before sending the write pointer off. Right? On the read side, it's the same thing, but it's going uh, ar around the loop, uh, and it's using the clock uh, to do so, right? So whenever there is data in this register, uh, as signified by this uh, valid uh, uh, gate, right? And we get a clock, then we pull data from the register and send the read token down the, down the loop. Uh, on, on, empty, uh, on the empty detector, we put a synchronizer, right? And that synchronizes the validity signal to the clock. Uh, and then we have some protocol that uh, correctly handles FIFO empty or FIFO full. Uh, with the ValReady interface. The big problem with this, what happens if the sender is slower than the receiver, then the FIFO will always be empty, and every new token that you receive will go through that flip-flop, that dual, two flip-flop synchronizer, and you're back to paying the same cost as just the normal two flip-flop synchronizer interface. Uh, so, so effectively, this system is assuming that the data coming into your system uh, is about the same speed as the clock. Uh, and if that's not the case, then you are going to run into performance issues. The group of people who figured out these problems with this system then went on to try to solve that. right? And so they did so by breaking up the metastability cost. Right? Uh, and it's instead of doing so uh, across multiple tokens, right, uh, kind of aggregating them, they did it across uh, different pipeline stages. Um, okay, <clears throat> and so this is called gradual synchronization. Now, in gradual synchronization, uh, we have these two flip-flops, and we know that we're going to be paying that two flip-flop cost. So if we're going to be paying that two flip-flop cost anyways, we might as well put computation in between these two flip-flops, right, as much as we can. And we're going to do so using self-timed protocols and architectures. Uh, and so if we take a step back and we look at kind of self-timed systems for handling metastability, uh, the one that we've developed so far is our arbiter, right? Now, if we want to uh, synchronize a self-timed a uh, self-timed signal to a clock, right? Uh, then what we can do is we can throw a clock on one side of the arbiter and a self-timed signal on the other, and and we can get rid of one of our metastability filter gates because we don't actually care about the output of the clocked side of this arbiter. Now, what this circuit does is it delays the out the upgoing transition on the output signal uh, 
toward the uh, the downgoing side of the clock, right? And so it forces your self-time system to wait until the clock, uh, until a downgoing clock edge or a downgoing clock level, I guess, uh, before continuing on to do its task. Now we can do a similar thing with uh, a mutual exclusive low element, right? If we kind of reverse this arbiter design and use a P latch instead of an N latch uh, and throw the, uh, the metastable signals onto the ground signal instead of the VDD signal, then we get mutual exclusion low on U and V. And we can adapt this circuit in order to uh, create another synchronizer, right? And so we throw the uh, our input signal, our asynchronous signal on one input, we throw our clock on the other. And what this does is it pushes the downgoing transition on our output into the positive level of the clock. Do these two circuits make sense? Okay. So our next step is that we need to be able to do both, right? We need to push the upgoing uh, transition on our output to one clock phase and uh, push the downgoing transition on our output to another clock phase, and we need to do so um, effectively. Now, this will still create some kind of arbitrary delay after the clock edge. And so this can still be desynchronized as a result of metastability uh, beyond the clock level of our, beyond this upgoing level of our clock, right? And so it'll, yes, it'll delay the output signal to the other side of our clock, but then it could continue to be delayed as a result of metastability through, um, through the next stage. And that's where you get your, uh, where you're paying your two flip-flop synchronizer costs effectively. Does that make sense? Okay. So in order to synchronize both sides of uh, the output signal, we can combine these two arbiters, right? And so we have an N clock signal and, an, and a P clock signal in this combined arbiter. And we only care about this uh, uh, metastability filter. And luckily, we can combine the two metastability filters by wiring uh, one metast metastable output to the VDD rail and one metastable output to the ground rail. Uh, and this gate is a uh, uh, is kind of a combined uh, combinational gate. It's still all one gate, right, as part of the flip-flop or as part of this uh, uh, arbiter, right? And so we have on our um, N latch side, we have uh, these two signals, right? Uh, I guess we have not underscore V and, sorry, I guess, uh, where, where are we? Do not N clock. Uh, so here we go. Here's our N latch side. We have uh, underscore V and N clock drives underscore U and down. So that's here. Uh, we have uh, uh, do, 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 underscore un and in uh, drives underscore v down. And so that's this node right here. On our p latch side, we have uh, uh, not, not underscore v and not p clock drives underscore up up. And so that's here. And then we have uh, not underscore up and not in drives underscore v up. And so what this does is it pushes the upgoing transition on the output into the negative level of the clock of the n clock, and it drives the downgoing transition on the output to the positive level of the p clock. Right? Okay. So. What if we want to drive our output, you know, delay our output transitions to both the upgoing transition of a clock domain, right? Or both the downgoing transition of a clock domain. Then we need to throw an inverter 
between n clock and p clock. Uh, and so we can either connect them up together, and so we we get we we separate them by uh, clock levels, or we can throw in uh, and we can invert that to get different um, uh, assign different levels to that, uh, or we can throw an inverter on it to get the same level. Right now, keep in mind that this. Output is delayed to clock up with the delay of the inverter. And so you have to account for that in the timing of your system. Right? OK. So we're going to call this gate a synchronizer. Right? And now we can throw our synchronizer into a handshake. Most conservatively, it has to go after our C element has produced a request, but before that request is then used to produce an enable signal going back, and before that request is used uh, to send out to the next process. And the reason for this, right, so this is the most conservative implementation. And the reason for this is because this synchronizes your input enable to the clock as well as your output request. And if your output enable is not synchronized to any clock, and you don't do this, right? If your synchronizer is, is placed here, and your output enable is not synchronized to a clock, then your output request won't be synchronized to a clock. If your synchronizer is over here, and your uh, input enable comes from this wire, then your input enable will not be synchronized to that clock if your output enable is not synchronized to that clock. Now, of course, if your output enable is synchronized to the clock, then you can start to play around with the location of the synchronizer, right? But this implementation is the most conservative. So there's still a, a, another problem with this, right? And that is when the clock signal is at the right level, right? In this case, low then a valid request can race through this synchronizer uh, and into the next uh, pipeline stage, right? And so any number of, of tokens can do that, and tokens can pile up on the input to your clocked domain, which is not what you want. And so in your next half pipeline stage, half buffer stage, you need to throw an inverter, you need to invert the clock relative to the synchronizer, right? In order to block that from happening. Now what we've done is we've taken this uh, two flip-flop synchronizer and we've turned it into a two synchronizer uh, self-timed stage, right? Where we can have compute on these pipeline stages. And however you want to, whatever compute you want to put in there, you're welcome to do so. Uh, this final stage of compute, you need to make sure that it uh, follows the uh, clocked assumption, right? The clocked system assumption, which is that it, it completes within a clock cycle. Uh, and that's fine. Um, OK. And so you know, what does that look like when you throw uh, asynchronous signals onto this gradual synchronization system. Well, in blue, so actually up here at the top, we have a clock and its inverse as generated by a uh, clock generator plus a latch to, to make sure that those two signals are mutually exclusive high. Uh, this first signal in blue shows a uh, completely asynchronous signal coming in. This is a three-stage uh, synchronizer, right? So gradual synchronizer, there are, there are three stages to it. Uh, this first one uh, enforces that uh, the, uh, basically it pushes these uh, transitions into the positive phase of the clock, right? Uh, this next stage pushes them into the negative phase of the clock, and this one pushes them again into the positive phase of the clock. Uh, the receiver on the other end of this is actually asynchronous. 
And so the enable coming into this is not synchronized to the clock, right? And so you'll get some extra delays on the yellow side. Uh, you'll get some delays from the request on the red side. And let's line up what this looks like. So the asynchronous signal, the asynchronous request on the sender side, you can see is comes in on the on the positive phase of the clock, sometimes right on the edge, and sometimes in the negative phase of the clock uh, over here, right? So it's not synchronized to the clock in any way. The red signal uh, is generally limited to the positive phase of the clock. Uh, however, sometimes it is at the beginning of that phase, as in here. And sometimes it is at the end of that phase, as in here. Right? It's still taking some time to synchronize. Uh, those are times where the metastability basically takes forever. Uh, the green one now is effectively synchronized to this negative phase of the clock, right? It always shows up basically around the beginning of that clock cycle, and you're good to go. Now, the yellow one will be a little bit less synchronized to the clock because we have an asynchronous enable uh, to test the system. But generally, again, it is synchronized to the upgoing phase of this clock. Can you go back a, a couple slides until you get to the thing that stops the clock? Is there a way where it, that clock generator can still be running and you're not stopping the clock generator and yet it still line up with the clock edges? Uh, yes, this system, so basically, if this system can complete during the negative phase of the clock on this signal, right, the negative phase of this wire, then it will not stop the clock, and it'll successfully clock in the signal. What I'm what I'm saying is 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 there a way where that clock gen so where that arbiter can still sit in between the clock generator and the sinker and the uh and the synchronous interface or whatever you want to call it here, right? So the synchronous service attached to those, but still have that clock generator running, powering some other synchronous circuits somewhere else. Or is there some kind of weird edge case that could happen if it's not, if it doesn't have that feedback loop into the, out of the arbiter and back into the clock generator to make sure that it's not trying to spit out more clock edges? The thing that prevents you from doing that is metastability, right? Um, you need to be able to wait, both systems need to be able to wait for the arbiter to make that decision, right? And if either system is not going to wait for that uh, arbiter to make the decision, then what will happen is the, uh, the input signal associated with that system that doesn't wait is going to be unstable into the arbiter. Uh, and that can be okay you'll get an unstable output from that side of the arbiter as well, right? Uh, but it also means that, you know, the, the thing that you're requesting here is the fact that the, the clock is stopped. It's the fact that you have the time to send in the data, right? Mm -hmm. um, and not stopping the clock means that the grant doesn't mean anything in that case. What I'm basic what I was trying to think of is there a way where you could have a p a small section of your synchronous uh, system that's running off the same clock as the rest of the synchronous. It's just some on some clock cycles, it just doesn't do anything. That's what I was trying to think because that would allow you to just kind of avoid all these things. But it sounds like you can't really do that with this setup at least. You may be able to do that with a with a phase lock loop <laughs> i don't know the specifics of that i can imagine where you know a system where part of the synchronous system has a stoppable clock and the other part doesn't um i don't know how one would build such a system so let's get into some examples uh, we have two examples uh, the first one in e1.act uh, we're going to, going to be implementing our uh, stoppable clock. Uh, we have a couple of uh, process definitions throughout this uh, set of ACT files. 
Our first one is the E101 to ValReady interface. Uh, it has uh, two channels, L and R, uh, sending one bit of data uh, across this interface. We have a request out to the stoppable clock, a grant back, and then the clock signal coming in from uh, the clocked system. Uh, we've set up a test bench with the uh, stoppable clock uh, process definition and the E101 ValReady uh, process definition. Uh, and we are simply driving the uh, ValReady interface uh, uh, acknowledgment back using uh, ready always up. If we then go take a look at our sync.act file, uh, we can see we have an arbiter already implemented here, exclusive high ideal. Uh, and then we have a uh, clock source, which we will use for uh, the next example. Uh, and then we have our stoppable clock uh, process definition. And so uh, our first step is to take this uh, uh, clock source right, and, and adapt it into a stoppable clock. Now, this clock source up here has a uh, positive clock and negative clock. And it's produced using a latch on uh, two inverted signals coming in from your uh, delay line in the, stop in the clock. Uh, this stoppable clock won't have that infrastructure, uh, but we do need to add in the arbiter uh, to implement the, the stopping part of the stoppable clock. Uh, and so our first step is to uh, grab in all the, all the sizing that we need. Let's, let's pull that in. And then uh, VN we're going to need. Uh, we're going to pull this down here. The next thing that we're going to need is our uh, delay line from the uh, with inverters, and uh, and that can go in down here. Uh, and then we're going to need to uh, call upon this exclusive high ideal uh, for our arbiter. And so let's let's do that here, uh, exclusive high ideal, and we're going to reset it uh, neutral. So reset underscore underscore n, and then we're going to size it up. Uh, using SZ. Uh, this is uh, templated with two input parameters. N is the number of inverters on the delay line, and SZ is uh, the sizing parameter. Uh, and so we're going to call this arbiter arb, uh, and we're going to uh, give it globals. And then on one side, we're going to give it the uh, request. Uh, on the other, we're going to give it V uh, N minus 1. And then uh, on the U and V side of the arbiter, arbiter we're going to give it a grant. It's going to produce the grant and V0. OK, uh, then we need to adjust the loop here uh, in order to implement our uh, delay line. So we need to uh, reduce this back down to 0. So we have V0 drives V1. And then we need to, uh, I believe, keep that at n minus 2 so that we have v n minus 2 drives v n minus 1. And then we have this exclusive high ideal uh, connect the two. OK, uh, that is our, uh, our stoppable clock. Now, we probably want to size this up a little bit. Let's give it uh, four times size for now um, so that we have a sufficiently strong clock signal. Uh, now. Uh, notice that the uh, in a real clocked system, your um, your gate capacitance uh, sitting on this uh, v zero node, right, which we are going to assign to clock. So uh, CLK equals v zero. So the capacitance on this node is going to be uh, quite high because it's going to be driving your entire clock domain. Um, and meanwhile, the capacitance on the grant signal here is going to be quite low. And so this is exactly the, uh, the time where we'd want to use the uh, ideal arbiter, um, as we talked about in uh, lecture 22. Uh, OK, so now we have our stoppable clock. Let's take a look at e1.act again. Uh, we need to implement our e1 of 1 to ValReady interface. And of course, step one, uh, we need a, a PRS body, g.gnd. Uh, and we need to create a latch between our input requests on L and our output data on R. And so if we take a look at channel.act, uh, we'll find that our, uh, you know, we have an E1 of uh, N encoding, E1 of 2 encoding for L. 
We have a ValReady uh, encoding for R. ValReady has uh, uh, multiple pairs. Represent a, each pair represents a bit, uh, and it's a dual rail encoding, but binary. Um, and uh, so what we're going to do is we're just going to take a latch. So uh, L dot D zero uh, or uh, the uh, data on R. So R dot D uh, zero. So that's data bit zero uh, dot D zero drives R dot D zero dot D one down. L dot D one or R dot D zero dot D one drives R dot D zero dot D zero down. So that's uh, the top half of our latch. Now we need the bottom half. So not L dot D zero and not R dot D zero dot D zero. Then that drives R dot D zero dot D one up and vice versa. So L dot D one and not R dot D zero dot D one drives uh, R dot D zero dot D zero up. Okay, so that latches in our data. Uh, the next step is to send out uh, a request for a grant when we have valid data. So, uh, and when the uh, receiver uh, is ready, so on R. So we're going to need R dot, dot ready. So this would be uh, L dot D zero or L dot D one. So we have data on our on the input side, on the uh, clockless side, uh, and our uh, clocked receiver is ready. So uh, and R dot R D Y. Uh, then we uh, will be raising the request, but we need to. Uh, this is going to be a C element, so we need an internal node. So underscore rec down, and that drives uh, rec high. Okay. Uh, we need to give ourselves that internal node, so bool underscore rec. Uh, once we get the grant back, we need to make sure that uh, our data has successfully been latched into this, uh, this latch. And so we're going to compare our input data against the latched data. So this is going to be L dot D0 and R dot D0 dot D0, or L dot D1 and uh, R dot D0 dot D1. And we need to make sure that we have the grant. So uh, and grant. And that will uh, set the valid signal high. So uh, because, again, this is going to be another C element, we need underscore val. Uh, and so then we get drive underscore val down, which drives valid up. OK. Uh, once we have valid driven high, we need to lower L dot E. So valid drives L dot E low. Uh, and that is the set phase of our handshake. And so now we need the reset phase. Um, and so when, uh, let's see, once the uh, once we know that the data has been clocked in, uh, we need to lower the request. So once we, we know that our data has gone neutral, our input data, so not L dot D0 and not L dot D1, when our input data goes neutral, uh, then we need to lower the request uh, for the grant. Uh, because we know that we've gone through this, this whole handshake and we're, uh, uh, we already have valid data sitting on the input to that uh, clocked latch. And so uh, that drives request low. Once request once the request is driven low for a grant, we need to wait for the grant to uh, be released so that we know that the clocked that this the uh, data on the clocked domain has uh, successfully been transferred. Uh, and so that will be not grant and uh, we need to make sure that the clock has actually fired so not underscore clock. Uh, then that drives underscore val up, which drives val down. And uh, this uh, doesn't have uh, any acknowledgment uh, from the uh, clocked side, right? So uh, this could be unstable if this, um, this term doesn't hold true. So in order to make sure that uh, this transitions before the clock does uh, on the uh, down going edge of the clock, we need to put after equals zero here, and we need to put after 
equals zero here. Uh, and then the final thing is we need to raise L dot E once that's done, so not val, L dot E goes high, and then we need to generate our clock signal. So clock drives underscore clock down, uh, not clock drives underscore clock up. And this is uh, this is unrelated to any acknowledgment paths, so we need to put a timing assumption on it. Uh, and uh, then we need to have internal nodes. This would be underscore clock. OK. Uh, so that's our system. That's our interface. Uh, let's see if it runs. So let's go. Let's call make e1. Take a look at e1.act. Val does not exist in current scope. Uh, so val is a is part of r. So r dot val. R dot val, and we need to drive r dot val here, and here. Okay, that's e1. Uh, we're gonna Let's open up the broccoli command line interface and prsim e1.prs source e1.rc. Uh, all right, we have weak interference on uh, underscore r0. Oh, we forgot to do reset. So let's take a look at e1.act. And we need to make sure to reset both the clock and this system. So if we take a look at sync.act as well, uh, this. Uh, I guess the, the clock is being reset. It's being reset to neutral. That's good. Uh, but the, the C elements in this system need to be reset. Uh, and in particular, we want to reset uh, both the request for a grant and the valid uh, low. And so this will be uh, g dot uh, underscore s reset and. And this will be g dot underscore s reset and. And then down here, we have. Uh, g dot, uh, not g dot underscore s reset or, and then the same thing here. Those are our C elements. Let's try this again. Clean, make e1, here's some e1.prs. Source, uh, source e1.rc, and cycle. Okay, it looks like it's working. Let's uh, take a look at the analog simulation. Here's some env.prs. Source PRSM.RC. And this will take a little bit. We want to give it sufficient time uh, in order to uh, see multiple requests go by so that we can uh, properly analyze the circuit. OK, let's take a look. Uh, PR view test.spy.prn. And let's see. So we have our clock signal. And you can see it's being stopped every now and then to uh, pull in data. We have uh, made the input requests on L uh, random timing with, with pretty uh, absurd delays in order to kind of expose the stopping behavior uh, and so that we can actually see what's going on. Uh, and then we have uh, our data on R. So let's put that here. And then we have uh, our valid and ready uh, values on R. And so let's put that here and uh, here. OK. So as you can see, if we zoom in a bit, uh, we have our clock. We have a clock cycle go by. There's no data on L. We have another clock cycle go by. Uh, and during the upgoing level of that clock, we have data coming on, on L. Uh, we need to, let's, let's pull in the, the request and grant signals from the arbiter. Uh, maybe we can see more information about uh, when the clock actually gets stopped. Uh, so there's the request, and there's the grant. OK. And so we see the uh, data coming on L. Uh, the clock is high. And so we send in the request. And then the we don't uh, win that arbitration until the clock goes low. Uh, once the clock goes low, we do win that arbitration. We get a grant back. Uh, and then we raise the valid signal. Uh, we then have to wait for uh, L dot E to go down, uh, where we didn't add L dot E in here. But once uh, L dot E goes down, then the input data uh, goes low. And once the input data goes low, 
then we can uh, release the request for the grant. Uh, and that uh, releases the grant, which turns on the clock, clocks in the data. Uh, and then once the data is clocked in, uh, we know that we can lower the uh, valid signal because the valid signal has been successfully clocked in to the clocked domain, along with our data uh, on uh, R here, right? So that's, uh, that's the operation of the stoppable clock. Uh, in this case, the uh, self-timed system is quite a bit slower than the clocked system. And so the, the, it kind of uh, shows uh, showcases this stopping of the clock. Um, you may also be able to design a handshake that doesn't have to wait for the input data to go low before allowing the clock to turn on again uh, in order to clock in the data. Um, that will probably be a little bit more overhead in terms of area uh, and energy uh, and state holding in general, but uh, it might allow your clock domain to, to run quite a bit faster. So let's walk through our second example. If we look at e2.act, uh, we have two processes to implement, sync and sync buff. Uh, and then we need to uh, use our uh, clock implementation in our sync.act. Um, sync uh, if we look down here, we'll find our source clock uh, implemented for us already. And so if we look at E2, let's uh, go back to the slides and pull in the full clock synchronizer since that is uh, a bit of a finicky uh, circuit to get right. I'm just going to pull in all of those production rules uh, and throw them into this uh, process spec. So PRS, g.bdd, g.gnd, uh, and paste all of our rules in. Uh, and let's format them up. We need to uh, build the uh, metastability filter by pulling uh, the out signal out into its own uh, PRS body. So let's do that. So PRS, g. Uh, so we're going to be giving, uh, we're going to be setting VDD uh, using uh, underscore UN, and we're going to be setting ground using underscore UP, and then we can get rid of these kind of uh, shared gate uh, nodes. And then we want to take these, uh, make exclusive statements and throw them into a spec body. So those go up here, spec. Uh, and then we want to declare all of our internal variables, all underscore un, underscore up, and underscore v. Uh, and then we, we still have n clock, in, p clock, uh, and out. Uh, so we are ready to go with that circuit. The next thing that we want to do is we want to use this to uh, create a buffer. So this would be prs g.vdd, g.gnd. Uh, we're going to have just a normal buffer that's reset low. So g underscore s reset and r dot e and l dot d zero drives underscore r zero down, which drives r zero up. Now we're separating this from r dot d zero because we want to uh, drive r dot d zero using the uh, synchronizer. So we're going to use r dot zero to drive l dot e low, and then we're going to have the uh, reset phase. So not g dot underscore s reset or uh, not r dot e uh, and not l dot d zero drives underscore r zero up, which drives r zero down. And again, we're going to use r dot d zero to drive l dot e up. Finally, we want to uh, grab this sync uh, circuit and uh, connect it up between r zero and r dot d zero. So sync, uh, and it's going to be uh, templated with size. Uh, this is our arb. Uh, and we're going to give it globals, uh, the n clock, which is underscore clock, the p clock, which is just clock, uh, and then in, uh, which is r0, and out, which is r dot d0. OK? So assuming we have implemented everything correctly, it should just work. Let's try it, e2. Uh, identifier r0 does not exist. So let's uh, make r0 and underscore r0 in here. Cool, underscore r0, r0 make e2, All right, face pearson e2.prs, source e2.rc, cycle. OK, looks like it's working. Let's uh, open up the analog simulation, uh, cd e2, pearson env.prs, source pearson.rc. Pearson. 
I give it some time to run. And let's uh, give it some more time. Okay, let's see what we've got. PR view, test.spy.prn. And we need to take a look at uh, A0. So that's the uh, request. That's the first request. We need to take a look at uh, C1, uh, C2, and then uh, B dot D. And we can take a look at, here's the clock. OK. So what do we have? Uh, this is the original uh, asynchronous circuit. It sends a request up uh, at various points in time, right? It uh, kind of unsynchronized with any clock signal. Uh, but as we get further down this, this trace, we see that uh, uh, the first channel in our buffer chain is, is pretty much synchronized to the upgoing uh, clock signal already, uh, and that just continues down the chain. So this is then synchronized to the downgoing clock signal, and then this is synchronized to the upgoing clock signal again. 